Here is uh, a technique that we use. If you do field stimulation, you can put a different frequency in each side of the brain. Because they're both fields, fields A and fields B. So basically, the right arm we know goes to the left hemisphere of the brain. But the right eye does not. Right? It's the right fields of both eyes goes to the left hemisphere. And the left fields go to the right hemisphere through this network called the optic chiasm. So we got, we got stimulus A, which is a fast stimulus, running through, hitting the left retinas, zipping down to the left uh, geniculate and, of course, um, uh, thalamus, and generating itself on the left side. Here is an example of a slower frequency, uh, no, frequency B, going across to the right-hand side. And so you can actually do two different frequencies. Can you think of an idea where that might be kind of a good thing to have? Well, a few places are, aside from doing a beta SMR approach for attention deficit disorder, depression, it can come in really handy. Here's a guy who has eight standard deviations, hot in alpha and four on the temporal on T3. Uh, severe depression, and also has a lot of this beta associated with the anxiety. Uh, couldn't wake up before noon for about three years of his life as in when he was in high school. One session of the beta, uh, what's, is what's now called an alpha beta. So the idea is we're going to give him beta in his, both his right fields for his left brain to inhibit that alpha to wake up basically his happy frontal lobe. And we're going to give him alpha on the left side. Not that he really needed it in this case because it was actually was quite in the hole, but that's what we did. And the idea is to keep the right side kind of sleeping, your, sort of your fear anxious side sleeping. And this is 45 minutes later. And you can see here, uh, there's quite a difference, uh, quite a reduction. And subjectively, he felt the lifting of the depression right away, within 45 minutes. Another thing is it dissociates people. And you can dissociate people who have all kinds of racy headedness going on, anxiety of all kinds. You can shut that down. Depressives have terrible amount of race going on. And usually it takes about five minutes to dissociate them out of their basic, out of their sympathetic state. And you can get them parasympathetic pretty fast. And here's some examples of that. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the hypnotic trances. This was Kroger and Schneider, the guys who invented the brainwave synchronizer. And they found that using alpha stim with the synchronizer, in about six minutes, 78% of everyone they tried were in a hypnotic trance. And twice as many were in a deep trance compared to a, a light trance. So very fast. This was another little study <coughs> um, done by Telch uh, at, at the U of T in Austin showing that when he looked at, at entrainment, these are good dissociators, these are poor dissociators. And he looked at entrainment versus dot staring or stimulus deprivation. That entrainment was more effective than those techniques. Then he did a, a second study. He's actually done six for us so far. And I'll show you his last study in a, in a few minutes here. He did another study where he took people who had dissociative anxiety. You know, when they get dissociate, they get highly anxious because they're uncomfortable there. And so he built, uh, he designed a dissociative index, and he measured the dissociative anxiety just before and after he put them on the gear. And you can see he doubled their dissociation in 20 minutes. Because, well, the stuff's supposed to work, so it should dissociate you. You kind of drift into a hypnotic or, or like a meditative kind of a state that's Normally, it's blissful for everybody, but for these guys, it's not. So their anxiety doubled as well. Well, if your anxiety doubles, what happens to your heart rate? Goes up, right? Heart rate went down. So even though they were subjectively experiencing anxiety, they were somatically calming, relaxing regardless. So he was really happy and excited about this, and he has been using it as a desensitization tool on this group of patients uh, since then. There's been a fair bit of work with it uh, for dental hypnosis. And this is uh, Margolis' uh, study here. Uh, I'm only going to show you about a quarter of the stuff that's out there because there's just way too much to cover. This is uh, Morris's study here. <clears throat> and you can see here, what's the worst part of any dental procedure? Yeah. It's the needle, yes. And you can see a uh, heart rate of 107 while you're laying back in a chair. It's a little fast. If uh, they run lights, it slows down to about 93. If they also play music, just music, to dissociate them further from the dental experience, they drop down to 85. 
It's not a dissociation in terms like an identity disorder or a pathological type of dissociation. It's like a meditative as if you learn to meditate, how would you dissociate? You know, when you meditate, you kind of lose awareness of your environment and of your body and of your thoughts. That type of dissociation, and you'll see kind of what happens. It, it, it really affects the hypothalamus. Of course, the thal hypothalamus is what regulates all the autonomic stuff in our body. And either it does it directly or it does it through the amygdala, <coughs> or it does it through the cortex via the amygdala. Because if we think scary things or watch a scary movie, our hypothalamus really activates. So, and there is a little beast right there. So what would happen if we shut down the cortex and these anxious people? This is guy, here is an anxious guy, and this is blood, this is finger temperature. And you can see at about the six minute mark when they're dissociating, hand temperature really starts to warm. And that's always a good sign. I use this with finger training because, how many do, how many do temperature training? How many of you find that they often fail for the first four or five times and they get kind of hopeless and quit? Any of you have, any of you have clients who've done that? Well, I've had clients who've done that. If you use entrainment along with it, you can actually keep, keep their fingers in a warming trend so they feel hopeful that they're not going to fail. And then you slowly weed the entrainment off as you do more and more sessions. I could share more of that with you uh, later on. Here is skin conductance. And again, look at it, about the six minute mark really relaxes. Skin conductance go away, goes way down. This is a forearm EMG. At about the six minute mark, muscles really relax in the forearm. Here's a migraine study, and believe it or not, in addition to using alpha frequencies, the participants preferred brighter intensities. That's totally backwards to what migraineers like, isn't it? But they were dissociating out of their migraine. This group had, there were seven subjects, this is Anderson out of England, Duncan Anderson, and they had, they recorded 49 uh, migraines, so roughly, I think 50 migraines, so about seven migraines per person. They had periodic vomiting and, and so on. Um, they were, when they were felt the aura coming on, they were to pop on the gear and run it in alpha. And they often ran about 30 minutes of entrainment. Uh, Pre-treatment migraine times are roughly six hours, and post-treatment was roughly 35 minutes. 49 of those 50 migraines were helped, and 36 were actually stopped in their tracks. So it was a powerful tool for migraine. How many of you, uh, this was Duncan Anderson. How many of you know John Anderson out of Minneapolis? He's treated about, okay, you do, Andrea, yeah. He's treated about 500 migraines with this uh, over the years. Yeah. How, how does this generalize to maybe getting rid of migraines altogether? Um, it, it typically does. Uh, we've had a high success. Say John Anderson has treated about 500 so far. And it does, uh, homeostasis in a sense starts to change. They get more relaxed, they get calmer, and they, they're, they trigger less. Uh, I also, nowadays myself as well, I get people on vitamin D. Uh, I have found some good studies linking 42% of migraine with vitamin D deficiency. So uh, I get them on vitamin D now in addition to using the gear. Um, this is a good example of someone that with a heart issue, certainly based on cortex issues. Okay? This lady's life was turned upside down when the police showed up at her door and charged her husband with molesting two young girls, ages six and eight. And he also had explicit child pornography. She moved to the city and filed for divorce. Her ex is also aggressive and blames her for his problem. Uh, he contends he's done nothing wrong, citing that those girls seemed okay with it, and he gets alternate weekends of her young son and daughter, which also upsets her. And you can see what's going on. This is the, this is the old freeze frame or the new M-Wave kind of drawing uh, graph. And I, I took the uh, spectral analysis part and I just inset it into the raw data part. But you can see this, all this spike and clamp activity, which is associated with uh, high sympathetic activation. 99 beats per minute. This is what they called an entrainment ratio. It's now called a coherence ratio in the newer software. 100% uh, in the low. She had no score at all. And all we do, and, and now we have the lights on, but they're not going. The glasses are on, but the lights are not going. We have the headphones on, but they're not pulsing. <clears throat> We're just having pacing their heartbeat. 
And then all we do is then we, we stop that recording, start another one, and we turn on the, on the, on the lights. This case was 7.8 hertz, or maybe it was 8 hertz, but right in that low alpha range. And as she dissociates out of that fear, her heart rate starts to really stabilize. She had a little hitch right here where some thoughts uh, intruded. Otherwise, though, this shot is, is 10 minutes after this shot, or less, and you can see her heart rate dropped 22 beats a minute. Uh, that quickly, and you can see how her entrainment or coherence ratio improved dramatically. This is a, what's called a meditator's peak, where there aren't the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. This here shows that in that sort of trauma state, she has all kinds of parasympathetic and sympathetic arousal. She's trying to breathe here at this point, and so and here she's breathing here. A little bit of sympathetic arousal correlating with this part in here, but very, very quickly got her grounded and stabilized. Uh, depression, that's another thing uh, that uh, this technology lends itself well to. Depression involves norepinephrine depletion, serotonin depletion, hippocampal shrinkage, and dopamine depletion. Here's a study done by uh, Sheely a few years back. Well, this is actually in 89. <coughs> and daytime levels of melatonin dropped 6%. Well, melatonin is associated with SAD. Dropped 6%. Uh, endorphins, strangely, went up 13%. Serotonin went up 23%, and norepinephrine went up 18 Well, this is really critical for fighting depression. I call it the Christmas signature. When you're all happy and excited and full of joy and peace and wonderment, serotonin and norepinephrine going up are always you know, correlated with happiness and feeling good and peaceful and, and so on and safe. And following on that, here's a study done on TMJ. Everybody knows what TM, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, with pain in your joint and clicking and all that. Here is this group here are people with less than one year of symptoms. This group has more than one year of symptoms. And MANS ran them on entrainment in the alpha range. And you can see for bruxism, emotional tension, muscle fatigue, insomnia, dizziness, headache, TMJ pain, masticatory muscle pain, um, jaw closing muscles neck muscle pain, otalgia, mastoid process pain, articular clicking, that's the little sounds they often make in their joint, mandibular deviation and restricted opening. Look at this, how quickly uh, all that went down. 